of the Southern California Open. Good evening, everybody. I'm Denny Schreiner, along with Mike Durbin. We're here at Town Square Lanes in Riverside, California, where the scores have been higher than the Dow Jones Industrials this week. They certainly have, Dan. Just to give you an example, our tournament leader, Brian Voss, this week averaged 228.5. And a further example of just how high the scores were in our position round last night, John Gant was in fifth place. He bowled 249 and dropped to seventh. And in that same position round, our top eight players averaged 247. So, Dan, if we get scores like that tonight, our viewers are going to be in for a treat. And time now to take a look at the participants on tonight's telecast, starting with unknown Dave Arnold out of the number five spot. Dave averaged a whopping 245 his last eight games and winning all eight of those games to make our championship round tonight. And Amleto Monticelli will bowl out of the number four spot. He loves this house. He finished second here in 1985. Oh, he's finished second a few times, six of them, in fact, but he never has won. He's kind of the sentimental choice here tonight, but he's got to win four games in order to get that first title. And representing the Midwest portion of the United States from St. Louis, Rowdy Morrow. Having his best year ever. This is his third appearance in our championship round this year. He also is without a title. Needs to win three games tonight to get that first victory. The hottest player on the PBA Tour is talented Mark Baker from nearby Garden Grove. He bowls out of the number two spot. Mark won just two weeks ago in Dublin. Was in our top 24 last week. Didn't miss the championship round by too much. And he's in second place tonight. So he obviously has the hot hand trying to make it two victories out of the last three weeks. And will Brian Voss's lucky number seven come up tonight? He's 0 for 6 from the top seed position. An outstanding player. His only flaw seems to be his inability to win from that top spot. As you say, he's 0 for 6. But Denny, he says number 7 is going to be his lucky charm. An unbelievable lineup of talented players on tonight's show, Mike. It certainly is. We have three players that go fairly straight, be kind of pointing it up from the outside. We have two players that hook the ball quite a bit, be starting it from the inside and sending it to the extreme outside and bringing it back. They've all bowled high scores this week. Let's hope they can do it again tonight. And with the 4th of July just around the corner, we thought it might be a good idea to introduce a fine local talent. His name is Robbie Britton. He'll be singing God Bless the USA. If tomorrow all the things were gone I'd worked for all my life And I had to start again With just my children and my wife I thank my lucky stars To be living here today Cause the flag still stands for freedom And they can't take that away I know I'm free And I won't forget The men who died Who gave that right to me And I gladly stand up Next to you And defend her still today Cause there ain't no doubt I love this land God bless the USA Better way to start tonight's action. Independence Day just around the corner. Outstanding performance by Robbie Britt. Coming up next, bowling starts. Dave Arnold out of nearby Campbell, California, will match up with Amleto Monticelli. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Active West Town Square Lanes in Riverside, California. There you see 25-year-old Amleto Monticelli, 5'8", 150 pounds, and uh, Mike Durbin, he will generate some hit, won't he? One of the big hookball bowlers on the PBA Tour, one of the most likable guys on the PBA Tour. Starts it in and sends it out. Perfect. Well, he's got to feel a little bit better about that first shot, Mike. After all, in 1985, he led this tournament and then was beaten severely by Dennis Jakes in the championship match, 212 to 146. Ouch. Well, I remember that particular telecast, Dan, and he was playing the same kind of line at that time, only the shot didn't seem to be there the day of the television show, and Dennis Jakes played the third arrow and just bowled very well, and 
I think and Little just needed a little more experience, which he has now. And that's the nation's first look at Dave Arnold. Oh, my goodness. That first shot on national television is always just a little tough, isn't it? Well, he got away with going through the heart of the pins, has only the 3-6. Dave bowled outstanding last night. Very straight player, very square game, four steps. And I really like this young man. He pulled just super in the clutch last night. Struck all the way up from the eighth frame to make our telecast. Dave won all eight matches last night. Average better than 245 in the process. He actually started last night's play, Mike, in 16th place. And boy, did he climb the ladder. And when he got to that 10th frame last night and he, he struck out, I asked him, you know, what was going through your mind? What were you thinking about? About, and he says, I was just thinking of making the shot. That was the only thing in his mind was to make a shot. And he defeated John Gant 257 to 249 in that position round game to go from sixth to fifth. So <laughs> the scores were very high indeed. Very tall at 6'3, 175 pounds. And he's a little lost, a little high the first time, a little light the second time, and I think that's just nerves. The lanes are a little bit tighter today than they have been. And by that, I mean that they're, the ball's not hooking quite as much as it has all week long. So you kind of got to point it up just a little bit and soften the speed just a little bit. Dave supplied the finest match play record of our television finalists throughout the week. 16 wins, 7 losses, and 1 tie. Actually won his last 9 matches. He'd like to win uh, number 10 in a row here. The first one tonight, very calmly, very coolly, though, shoots the cross alley spare. Well, he feels a little better now. He got two spares underneath his belt. He can sit down and watch M. Leto go to work. M. Leto finished seventh here in 1986. He has finished twice in second place this year and six times overall in his career. He is way, way overdue. Oh, Light hit carries. Well, that uh, little double reminiscent of Jim Harvey's 11 consecutive strikes last year, and he ends up shooting the 297. M. Little, five steps. Watch this open shoulder right there. The ball is turned all the way back around. Look at the head. Now watch his arm as he comes through. Then his arm will actually be bent at the bottom of the swing. Comes right in here, and it's bent there. It's not extended. And he lifts hard with the fingers, hits the ball on the upswing, and as he follows through, as Nelson Burton Jr. said, he looks like a guy pulling a lawnmower string. <laughs> well, he ripped that one on the left-hand lane. Flush again on lane 45, and Monticelli is off to a very quick start. He is perfect through three frames. And Dave Arnold, uh, as Billy Whalu used to say, is getting his baptism under fire tonight. Trails by 22 already. Dave, in his uh, third year as a PBA professional, career earnings $38,577. Uh, only bowled seven tournaments last year and won $17,000. I thought that was outstanding. Oh, you're not I kidding. Hey, $2,000 a week, that's pretty solid. Better shot. I know you were very impressed with this young man last night, the way he stormed through a very talented field. Well, one of the reasons why is he has such a solid game. Then. And we can see it's a four-step here. He pushes the ball and steps at the same time. The ball goes into a pretty much of a free swing. He's got a nice, long arm. The ball is actually just a freckle late in his timing there. Gets it pretty close right here. Nice, deep, <laughs> deep knee bend. Good follow-through on balance. Left arm out there. It's a nice game. Can't go much. Can't go wrong with that game. For the double. Oh! The old splice omatic there in the fourth. So Arnold bounces right back with a double of his own. He trails by 12, and there you see M. Leto. He is lining up, getting ready, perhaps for strike number four. Tour will be visiting Tucson, Arizona for the $140,000 Miller Light Challenge. That's live July 8th, 9 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. As I mentioned from Tucson, Golden Pin Lanes down there in Tucson. And Pete Thomas and his crew, I'm sure, Mike Durbin, preparing for an outstanding event next week. Tucson always been one of my favorite spots. Uh, you won a title down there, didn't you? Yes, I won with a finish second a couple of times and third another time. All right, I'm Leto Monticelli from Venezuela. With three strikes in the first three frames. And, uh, he appears to be pretty well lined up. Sends it out. Here it comes. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Why is it that when he sends it out there, Mike, you suspect it might not get back? 
Well, I never saw my ball do that. <laughs> <laughs> if you threw it out there, it was definitely Channel City, wasn't it? Well, three at the most. <laughs> Watch him here. He's going to start this ball in about the second arrow. Just right of it. Now watch it get out to maybe the third board down the lane. Fourth board, somewhere in that area. And watch it cover 13, 14 boards in the last 10 feet. Man, you need a turn signal for that shot. Now you see the scoreboard. And Lotto up by 22. A little off balance that time. Not quite the same lift that he had back in the second frame on that lane or in the third frame and he leaves a soft 10 pin. Tableto in 1987 211.4 and he is ranked in the top 20 among averages on the PBA tour. Has the spare. Really uh, a player Mike that uh, runs a couple of times a day is an excellent physical shape and really works hard on his game. Most people out here think that he is the hardest worker that we have out here as far as taking care of himself, uh, doing exercises, meditation, practice, everything that it takes, staying away from the party life uh, to be a successful professional bowler. So he'd be the James Brown of the PBA Tour. I did. Hardest working man in show business, of course. All right. For three in a row. Good turn. Just didn't get that temp in out of there. The lane's just a hair tighter today, and he wasn't quite as long with that follow -through. In watching him bowl last night, Mike, I just got the impression, he just kind of reminded me of a young Dave Sutar. Everything, nice flowing motion, never changing expression, same thing every single time, no matter what happens, come back, make the spare. Mm -hmm. Throw every ball in the pocket the same way Sutar did. Tall, sure. Head straight, solid. As the spare. Dave Arnold, only 23 years of age. He is the Bambino on tonight's telecast. Of course, Brian Voss is the old man of the crew, and he's 28. Well, you, you know I have a son, 23, don't you? Mm-hmm. I wasn't going to say anything, Mike. And there you see uh, Dave's grandparents on hand this evening, Robert and Irene Hall. And they're obviously very excited. Be more excited if he was ahead by 22. Well, he's still in the match. He's found the pocket. Boy, he just splices him out there on that left lane. Well, Dave's highest finish PBA-wise earlier this year in the AC Delco Classic, where he ended up seventh. And as we've mentioned, this is his first appearance on national television, representing himself very nicely. Back, meanwhile, to Amleto Monticelli. Solid 10 pin. Boy, you can't throw it much better. Well, we've seen some solid 10 pins, but just prior to the telecast this evening, Mike, you mentioned that uh, we might see a couple of swishing 710s perhaps tonight. As we see them little, I do think so. Uh, I'll comment that on later. Watch the six pin here as we get a ground view level. The six pin just flies right around that 10 with Amletto, especially, I think. Uh oh, just enough. With Amleto or the other hookball bowler on our telecast tonight, Mark Baker, sending it out and having to come in late behind the head pin, there have been a lot of pocket 710s left, where that 5 pin goes behind the 7 and the head pin goes in front of it. Plus, again, with the hookball bowler, sometimes they send it a board or two too far, it comes back and leaves the old equalizer for those guys, the 2810. You have real problems when you leave those 2810s. Yeah, I didn't leave it too often, so I didn't have that problem. And others, like eight tens, and <laughs> it's always something. Monticelli leads by 21, make it uh, 31. Nope, make it 21, because Arnold is on a strike, and there is his brother, Rodolfo Monticelli, and uh, he obviously is pleased with what's happened thus far. We'll be right back right after this. Slender Dave Arnold out of Campbell, California. He trails by 21, but he's working on a strike in the sixth. Big frame coming up from right here. Cut that lead down to 11 and set himself up to really put the pressure on Monticelli. Soft 10 on this lane the last time. See if he gets it up a little higher in the pocket. Light again and carries that light hit. Says, heck was solid. I'm going for that high percentage hit late. 
right, here's Dave Arnold from the extreme outside, pointing it up, not getting the revolutions that Monticelli does, but getting the same result. Hits the head pin thin, and that old 457 going out that wall shot. And Dave, throughout the week, averaged 194 on the championship pair, games of 215 and 173. That compared, of course, to Amleto averaging 251.5 on the championship pair. Struggled, didn't they? Oh, he sure did. This can cut it to a one-pin ball game. Oh, oh, oh. This kid can respond under pressure. I mean, wait till he gets used to the television lights, huh? <laughs> it's always, though, the first time you're on, you're not really afraid because you've never you're lost not? before. You're not? Oh, <laughs> come on, Mike. These kids today, they go right out there and throw strikes. They don't worry about national television. I guess you're right. Well, that 21-pin lead has been trimmed considerably. He says, if you can hit him thin and carry, so can I. Boy, beautiful strike shot there, but uh, I'll let you go ahead and take and this, Mike. With this unusual style, the arm, the hand turns all the way back, and then it's a snapping motion right on through. The ball over about that second arrow goes scooting on out to near the channel. He carries the light hit. Now the big ninth frame. Up by 11, can bump it right back up to 21 with one more here. Every ball in the pocket so far. Well, somebody yelled, come on, almost too soon. Almost before he threw it, but it didn't seem to bother him. I was going to say, Mike, getting back to one point, Amleto's throwing a lot of strikes here, but last night, if you can believe it, he picked up the 3 4 seven, nine, and then went out the rest of the way and shot 280, and that kind of vaulted him onto the show. It really did. It was in the second or third game of the evening round. And <laughs> well, that was <laughs> unbelievable. We've hardly even seen that split <laughs> left. We have to be sitting right there, and then he made it. Well, brought down the house. Dave Arnold, once again, will try and answer the call, answer the challenge. Well, the phone is ringing. Let's see if he can answer it. Light. Wow! That blows a match hit. This kid uh, definitely can answer long distance. I mean, <laughs> well, he's already won a PBA regional, and he's currently second, I think, in the Western Region. And, uh, so he uh, has some talent. Uh, I think it's more a question of adjusting to the national tour and getting a, ch a chance to play out there full time. You know how important and, that is, and Mike. Rolling on the conditions as we see the score right here and the situation is that he can strike all the way out for 257 and Leto can go all the way out for 268 we could have a tie it's a possibility of a tie here still has to have this one though cuts it to one with his strike in his favorite lane right there oh perfect nothing seems to disturb this kid I'll tell you what he's looking over at the score now saying well what what's the situation here I know I've thrown a lot of strikes but <laughs> And he has. He's got five in a row going. This is to take the lead, then, for the first time in the match. And this puts him in the 250s and makes Amleto strike in the first ball of the 10th. No, he's only made uh, two top 24 finals this year. And this is his first telecast, but he's taking advantage of the opportunity. Light knocks that 10 pin out of there. Those are the same hits that he had last night in the 10th frame that half pocket hit and when you see that 10 pin snap out of there like that you know that the bowler had good finger lift because that's what knocked that six pin will tell you when it lays in the channel you didn't quite catch it this is important here too the strike on the fill ball gives him the full count of 257 he's up by nine pins if he gets this strike he forces Amleto to get two to beat him A solid 10 pin for 256 with an outstanding performance. Well, eight strikes in his uh, opening test on national television. I would say that was probably an A for effort. I mean, a little jittery the first two frames, and after that, every ball in the pocket. And Amleto knows the situation. We still have the possibility of a tie. Haven't had one of those yet. Nope. There's a first time for everything. A little extra time. And it fell! I don't believe it. It was going to stand, and then it fell. 
Well, a little uh, late on the nine pin, but Amleto Monticelli has really been snake bit on television the last couple of years, and he might have gotten the break of his career right there. Watch this. Watch your two pin. Third from the two pin hits the four, the four falls to the nine, and the nine falls. Boy, look at that reaction from Amleto. Now the situation still, he's, he has not won yet. He needs nine pins and a spare in order to win. And there you see Amleto very alertly contacting uh, Harry Golden, PBA's national tournament director. He was the tournament leader of the PBA Nationals in Toledo this year. Against Randy Peterson, he needed to double in the 10th frame, and he left a solid four pin. Right now, he'll settle for a four pin. If he'd have done that at the PBA National, he'd have won that tournament. Well, there's no question in anybody's mind out here, he is a very talented player who really should be in the winner's circle. Oh, a lot of room, a lot of room. And it comes way back. Well, that was an explosion there. You see the look in his eyes as the young Venezuelan, very pleased with his opening victory, and Dave Arnold couldn't have bowled much better. 256, and he loses his first time on television. The kid says, well, welcome to the PBA. I mean, this is how, how tough it is out here. The scores have been tremendous all week. And last year, remember, Jim Harvey started with 297 in the opening match here at Town Square Lanes. It makes me remember my first game in, in match play uh, portion of the PBA tournament was in San Jose in 1967. I bowled Jim St. John, and he bowled 298 after the first game. Oh. As Leto finishes with 268. Well, a blistering pace set by the young professionals here in the Southern California Open. 268 to 256. Dave Arnold will leave with $4,000, and you would think 256 would be good enough to come up a winner on the PBA Tour, but not this evening. Amleto cooling off just a little bit. Next match, Rowdy Morrow out of St. Louis will test Amleto Monticelli. I have a feeling he had better be ready because Amleto is lined up at this stage. And don't forget, coming up next, Bowling News. Welcome to this week's edition of the Bowling News. And tonight we'll start off with some highlights of the 68th Annual Women's International Bowling Congress Championships, which were held earlier this year at Earl Anthony's Bloomfield Bowl in Hartford, Connecticut. Some outstanding scores. Robin Romeo and Laura Grant teamed up to roll a record 1328 in the doubles. Romeo shot 688. Grant added a fine 640 series to set that brand new mark. And another outstanding feat came when Linda Kelly of Union, Ohio, authored a perfect game. Only the third 300 game recorded in WIBC tournament history in some 20 million tries. Some people never know when to quit, and rightfully so. Take Ethel Brunick, for example. Ethel rolled games of 103, 111, 127. Well, that's not too bad for someone who has a 109 average and who also just so happens to have been born before the turn of the century. That's right, Ethel is still striking at the tender age of 99. And there's a first time for everything, including your first 600 series. Luann Stavola eclipsed the 600 plateau earlier this year in the WIBC, capturing her first ever Division II singles title. Speaking of record performances, top female pros Lisa Wagner and Pat Mercatante dialed in the all-time best women's double score in bowling history. The talented tandem averaged a whopping 251, plus en route to setting a brand new standard at Red Burnham's Bradley Bowl in Windsor Locks, Connecticut. Time now to get caught up on the latest PBA regional results. Down in the southern region at uh, Titusville, Florida, Curtis Odom was the winner. And then, of course, back east, Arnie Goldman, a former PBA touring pro, used a big 290 game down the stretch to come up a winner in Cranston, Rhode Island. The recently concluded collegiate bowling season provided some outstanding team bowling. And here's now a look at some of the top programs in the country and the way they stacked up in 1987 as rated by the BWAA. The Shockers of Wichita State accrued nearly 260 points, while San Jose State and West Texas State currently filled out the top three. And as you can well see, Wichita State dominated the collegiate ranks this year. WSU collected 260 points and finished a strong number one. The Big Ten was also well represented in 1987, with the University of Minnesota Golden Gophers nailing down the number five position in the final rankings. 
And joining me now, one of the pioneer bowling writers out on the West Coast, the current editor and publisher of the highly acclaimed Pacific Bowler, a man with better than 40 years of experience in bowling writing, uh, sitting to my left, and the man of whom I speak is Mr. Joe Lou. Joe, first question, you've been involved in, in writing bowling, uh, not only on the West Coast, but all over the country for the better part of 35 years. What's the biggest change in the sport from the early 40s to, say, now in 1987? Well, here in Southern California, I would say that it was the uh, organization and the remarkable growth of our regional professional uh, tournament clubs for men and women. And I can remember back in attending the first men's regional professional tournament in October of 1965, and about three months later, I attended the first women's regional professional tournament. Well, what an incredible memory. You've covered a lot of bowling. I think you've probably watched more bowling than Chuck Pisano has <laughs> over the last 40 years. What about the tremendous turnout as far as the professionals are concerned from Southern California? They're now taking effect all over on the national tour. Why is that, Joe? I think it's because of uh, the experience that they've uh, gotten in our regional professional tournaments. And then before that, they started in the junior program and we have a very very strong junior program out here in southern california as well as the other club bowling there's a lot of club bowling now out here in southern california isn't there that's true that's true and i think we have probably more than maybe 15 different tournament clubs for amateur bowlers and they bowl every week you know week in and week out do you think joe that uh, that maybe the bowlers on the west coast spend more time bowling year round than maybe they do in some of other parts of the country oh yes i'd say so there's no question about it because like back in the east and midwest they often take two or three months off during the summer whereas out here they bowl year round joe keep smiling and do me a favor write bowling for another 25 or 30 years at least i'd love to <laughs> thanks to joe lou for stopping by mike durbin and i'll be back to compare statistics here in riverside california right after these messages The bowling news joining me now mike durbin and mike uh, without further ado lots of money on the pba tour so let's update the folks and find out who uh, is needing an accountant this summer okay we're going to take a look at the top 10 money winners we see that same name pete weber on top with mccordick in second ballard third randy peterson in fourth and the great marshall holman at eighty six thousand dollars dave ferraro who just missed this week is sixth with walter ray Tom Milton, who's nursing a sore arm. Brian Boss, our tournament leader tonight at $61,000. And Amleto Monticelli at $58,540. That same name, Marshall Holman leads our average parade at 218 even. Pete Weber right behind him. Dave Ferraro bowling steady all year long at 215 plus. Mike Albee, the top lefty right now at 215 too. And David Ozio at almost 215. Some other big names, Mark Roth in seventh place, Walter Ray right there in eighth, Randy Peterson in ninth, and Rowdy Morrow rounds out the top ten at 213.8. If you like to see ten in the pit, lots of strikes. The fans this week in Riverside certainly got their money's worth because the pros really threw some strikes this week. Well, there were a lot of strikes this week as the pros scored high. Brian Voss, our tournament leader, averaged 228. We had several 300s and a few 299s. So, Denny, there were uh, a lot of strikes out there. You probably could have thrown a few yourself. <laughs> but all those solid 10s, come on now. I can never make the 10 pin. But what about some of these numbers? Look at these numbers. Well, we see that all of our players this week, that's all 160-man field, average 210.15. The right-handers, 211, almost 212. Well, the lefties didn't fare as well this week, a little less than 200. What you needed for the cash was a 215.33, and to make the top 24 a whopping 222 average, Dan. Our best match play record, however, was by a left-hander, the only one in the top 24, John Gant, had a record of 17-6-1, and, and he had 36 consecutive 200 games. Along with the high averages, we also had some high games. Here's our 300 list, headed up by Mark Fay, Steve Jarles had one, Jeff Rickles, and Doug Wallace shot a 300 in the PTQ. Some 299s by Mike Edwards, good-looking Bill Swanson, and Del Warren. Mike, I know through the years you were a proponent of uh, medium average scoring tournaments. Certainly this week, the highest scoring tournament of the year. At one point uh, during round number three, Mark Fay averaged 261 for six games. What are your thoughts about the high scoring events? Well, that's an awful high score when you can average 261 for six games. I never could keep up with that kind of scores. 
But this week, the players were able to play more or less toward the outside part of the lane, where they could swing it toward that channel and get it back. And they didn't leave a lot of the solid tens and the solid eights that sometimes you do leave. And whenever these guys can uh, create that area to the right and have good carry, you're going to see high scores, Denny. Well, hopefully we'll see some more strikes here this evening from Riverside, California. That does it for this week's edition of the Bowling News. And coming up next in Southern California, it's the M&M Boys. Amleto Monticelli and Rowdy Morrow, they'll tee it up on the championship pair, so stay tuned. The key shot in game number one in the 10th frame, Mike. The turning point of game number one, the first one in the 10th that Amleto Monticelli had to have to stay in the match, trips the four into the nine, the nine wobbles, and then finally makes up its mind to fall. And then he went on to get one more after that. There's his reaction, he knows that that one's going to send him on to the next match against Rowdy Morrow. Mmm, baby. Ten yes, strikes sir. to, let's see, how many did Arnold eight. have? Eight. Ten to eight, huh? Ten to eight. Kind of like the home run count in the American League these days. Per game. No letdown. El Amleto picks up right where he left off, throwing strikes. What a disaster he had here in 1985. I wonder if he's thought back at all to that 146 game. Well, I'm sure he's put it out of his mind by now, especially that 268 game will help you forget about things like that. First look at Rowdy Morrow. And this is his third appearance in the championship finals in 1987. He's had a solid year, and that's the reason why. A very accurate, compact player who hits the puck. Well, he made the championship round in the uh, Las Vegas tournament, then he made it later on in Baltimore. In both tournaments, he pulled good games, but he got off behind right away, made a big comeback. In one of them, he left a 10-pin and missed it. The other one, he left a 4-pin and missed it. So we'll see if that repeats itself here. There you see 25 years of age, 213.64 overall, and uh, that ranks him 10th on the PBA average list. He's definitely making his mark on the PBA tour. He's been on here a while. Oh, and trips that four, and he says, all right. <laughs> Little backhanded slap of the four pin. And, and watching Rowdy practice before the telecast this evening, he started shooting at his spares almost immediately. I said, are you so lined up you don't need the strike shots? He said, no. I missed a couple of spares earlier this year. Both times it cost me the match. I'm not going to miss any tonight. He's uh, going to have to throw a lot of strikes, though, I think, to beat this gentleman from Venezuela. You never know. And Leto's got to keep the pressure on him. A little soft. Just eased up on the speed on that one. And he's looking at the lane. Now, he, I don't know if he realizes that up. That was him. That wasn't the lane. Left the 3-6-10, avoided the split. Amleto's career television record, 10 wins, 15 losses, and uh, averaging a fraction better than 2-12 per game on national television. He really has bowled in some cases very well and just hasn't been able to come up with the big breaks. Let's see if he throws it straight or throws a hook at the 3-6-10. Throws a hook and makes it. He kind of was in between. This time, watch him at the end, Danny, right here. He just kind of eases up with the follow through and the speed. Doesn't snap it out there like he had before. And the ball's much, well, this is in slow motion. You can't see it, but the ball is slower in the ball speed than it had been. OK, Mike, I'll also play the straight man. Why does Amleto have two different colored shoes on? Well, because he slides better with the one shoe. He's been doing that for years. I mean, he's had that on. I was glad you were going to tell him he wasn't colorblind. <laughs> or that that's the new style in Southern California. That one's flush in the 1-3 pocket on the left-hand lane. Good speed on that shot. Rowdy Morrow averaging 227 for the week on the television pair. Games of... 246 and 193 for a 219.5 average. His high game 280 this week. So uh, the youngster from St. Louis blistered the pocket as well. Light. Ooh, it hit that five pin, but didn't knock it over. Stubborn five. Boy, today's contemporary game, you very seldom ever see the five pin wiggle back and forth and stand by itself. I used to see it all the time. From behind, we see Roddy Morrow, five step player, pushes the ball out there on the second step. Here's the ball. Swing is straight there, straight in the backswing. Bounces out a little bit at the top. Now brings it right back in and straight on down through. His swing is better than it used to be. At the top of that swing, it used to bounce to the right more. And it's straighter. We get a nice shot from behind there. 
Thus far this year, he is 20th on the PBA money list with earnings in excess of $43,000. Overall in his career, a little better than 128,000 in six years as a PBA member. And there you see graphically the story after three frames. Up by nine pins. And, ooh, a solid 10. I think Rowdy thought uh, he had uh, all 10 that time as he kind of backed up and took another look, and that was a solid 10. That pin always seems to be there. Match play record this week for Rowdy Morrow, 14 wins, 10 losses. It was tough to win here this week. If you didn't start off with about the first five or six, it was downhill the rest of the way. So Morrow spares in the fourth frame, and he trails by, or make that he's up by eight pins. I'm sorry. And uh, there it is, the beautiful Miss Riverside, 1987, Tiffany Harmon, gracing us with her beauty this evening. That's prettier than a 1-3 pocket strike, isn't it, Mike? Yes. <sighs> Even for the title? Even for the title? No, not oh, for the okay. title. Well, <laughs> no offense, <laughs> Tiffany. Let's see if Amleto keeps his speed up this time. He gives it a little more room. Gave it the room. Here it comes. Oh. Pavletto's interesting as he goes to the foul line. It's, it's, a, it's a wandering path a little bit. He drifts to the left and then throws it back to the right. And you get a look at it right here. See where he's standing? Now watch him go to the left. Here. But Mike, they always teach you don't drift either way. Well, Pavletto's just an athletic performer. And he comes back and then just sends it further to the right. A lot of time, Elaine will be hooking more, and he doesn't really move. He just drifts a little bit more and throws it a little further right. Up by two can increase it to 12. A lot of lift. And the light hit. Yeah, he's starting that lawnmower once again. <laughs> Boy, when he gives it that whiplash, it's like a crack the whip. Remember that game you used to play when you were a kid? Yes, I do. Wow. He revs it up when he does that. He sure does. Turn on the afterburners. But Rowdy Morrow, who doubled to start the game, would like to come back here in the fifth and uh, keep a little pressure on him, little Monticelli, who is really freewheeling it at this point. Perfect. Big shot coming up for Rowdy right now, Denny, because psychologically he needs to strike here to keep the pressure on Monticelli. In the match play portion of this event earlier this week, Amleto Monticelli defeated Rowdy Morrow in a very close game, 210-205. Rowdy becoming a consummate professional. Takes that time, gets himself set, he's ready to throw. A lot of speed, and it didn't hold. Short with that follow through, he had good speed, but it just wanted that shot so badly, and he left the solid 10 on that lane the last time, that you have the tendency to just squeeze it up there a little bit tighter to make sure it carries, and then you go through the nose a little bit high. Well, he hasn't won on the national tour, but Rowdy does have six regional titles to his credit, so he knows how to win. It's just a question of putting yourself in that position enough times to get the job done. That's true, but winning on the national tour is, tour is different than winning the regional. It's just uh, there's something extra special about it. Not that it isn't difficult to win on the regional program, it is, and you don't have a lot of times you beat the same guys. But it's just that prestige that goes with winning on the national tour. And, of course, the Firestone Tournament of Champions goes with it, too. Monticelli looking for the four-bagger on the right-hand lane. Cut that one a little short, but kept the speed up. And, boy, once again, solid in the pit. Amleto is just freewheeling it right now. As long as he gets that ball to the right a little bit, it doesn't hook early, and it's going right to the 1-3 pocket. Cute story earlier this year, Amleto made the finals uh, at the showboat in Atlantic City, and he loves to jog and run. Had his Walkman on, and he was running out, and uh, got about eight miles out from the hotel and realized that he didn't have time to get back for the show, so he jumped and took a cab. <laughs> that's dedication. Boy, I'll tell you, that's called uh, thinking in a pressure situation. What if he didn't take any money with him? <laughs> One more for five, and he's got it, boy. I know one thing, he won some money in Atlantic City. He's gonna win some more here this evening as his brother Adolfo looks on, and he is pleased with the effort thus far. We're gonna take a short break here as Amleto has developed a 32-pin lead. Stay tuned.
We're back at Active West Town Square Lanes in Riverside, California. And we're live, and this is the finals of the Southern California Open. Rowdy Morrow knows exactly where he is at and knows what he has to do. And that strike, light, and the dinner bucket. He lost that ball in the downswing, didn't get the lift, and he's in big trouble right now. He's falling further and further behind, and uh, when a guy's doing nothing but striking against you, and you have no reason to think that he's not going to continue to do that, it really puts a pressure on you. Switches balls for the third time at the spare, right at it, and chops it. And this match is pretty much history right now. Uh, Rowdy right now, if he goes all the way, his potential 223, 47 pins down, throws this dark ball at the 2458. Those pins are 12 inches apart, and that's why you can chop it just like that. Not to bring up a uh, sore point, but uh, Rowdy is 0 for 3 on national television, and uh, although he's averaged 214, he's yet to break into the winner's circle, and you can almost see him out there. You just, you try so doggone hard to get the job done, and some nights it just doesn't want to happen. Well, winning that first game on television, I know, can be tough. Uh, Winning a game on television a lot of times can be tough. As I told you one time before, I went from 1972 to 1979 without winning a game on television. And then Did suddenly you, I uh, broke loose and, and won a bunch of them. When did that. the uh, psychoanalysis start? Was it 74, 75, <laughs> or about when, when did that all start? Well, I wasn't bowling full-time, so it didn't bother me that much when I was <laughs> uh, about 77 or 78. Hey, I'm convinced you could hire a full-time shrink out here, couldn't you? Yeah, well, when I, I guess what it did start was when I bowled 268 and didn't win. So. Well. That would send you to the couch. And Leno with a commanding 47-pin lead. Just needs to keep the ball in the lane, basically. Keep his concentration up high. Lack of speed again. Just a little, little lapse of concentration and not keeping that speed up. Mike, describe M. Leno's game a little bit. He holds the ball up high, but then brings it down before he even really even starts to move. Well, with M. Leno, again, it's all natural athletic ability. Obviously, he didn't read how to bowl like that in a textbook. But he is just a natural athlete. He was a great soccer player, and he, he does it all on instinct and natural athletic ability. Would you compare him at all to, say, a player like Mark Roth, another guy who is a real field player? Because a lot of times Mark will take seven steps, six steps, maybe five. It just depends on, I guess, what feels good at the time. Well, I think uh, and let him watch Mark as he was growing up, as we see another replay of his unique style and that hand opening up that shoulder wide open, which you don't recommend because it's so hard to get it back closed. Let's see if he closes it up. He got it all the way back. Question is, will he be able to do that when he's 35? Hmm. Of course, he may have made enough money by then, but he won't care. I know one thing. I bet the guy could toss a Frisbee about 300 yards. <laughs> oh, he's an interesting guy to watch. Uh, really one of the uh, most well-liked players out here. And I think... Although you want to see each and every player that uh, that makes the telecast win a tournament, I know there are quite a few folks pulling for Amleto Monticelli. Well, if Rowdy Morrow doesn't strike on this ball, Amleto doesn't even need to show up for the 10th frame. Well, that's a solid professional shot, bouncing back in the clutch. And even though uh, it's always darkest before the dawn, Rowdy Morrow with an excellent shot there in the ninth frame. Well. Rowdy's potential 213. Right now, Amleto has 208 if he doesn't throw another ball. So, uh, again, he must strike here in order to keep it even somewhat interesting. Rowdy, the top seed earlier this year at the Fairlanes tournament and lost there. So, uh, it's only a question of time before this guy ends up with a PBA national victory. There you see a shot a little high and leaves the fourth. Well, he's going to finish fourth here, get a good paycheck. And go on to Tucson, Arizona next week and hope to do better there. And he'll uh, collect $5,000 for his efforts this week. Not a bad week's work. Nope, and when you consider the fact that he's already made 43, he's just shy of $50,000. By far and away, his best year ever on the PBA Tour. And, and he's got almost half the year left, so uh, Rowdy could make a good $75,000, $80,000 this year, or maybe even more. Well, he bowled so well last night. As a matter of fact, he defeated uh, Brian Roth, or Brian Voss, I should say, in uh, the the position round game last night was too far behind at that stage, but boy, he started with the first seven last night. This guy can bowl. Naturally, but it doesn't matter, then they all fall. 193.
But little trouble Amleto has had has been on lane 46 on this right lane. Well, Amleto started with a 268-256 victory over Dave Arnold in game number one. If he strikes out, he'll shoot 258 in game two. Is it the room? <laughs> Spins don't have a chance. It's definitely a case of overmatch. Well, he threw 10 strikes in game number one, and he's got eight here in game number two thus far with two shots left. Be 10 and 10, huh? That's kind of a nice average, don't you think? 10 well, strikes a game. You love to get that kind of run, then. <laughs> yeah. 10 a game, boy, we'll take it. X marks the spot. One more. Amleto is really loosey-goosey at this point, too, Mike. He's just letting that thing go. But I'll tell you, he's only thinking of one thing now. I mean, he's he's keeping it going, but he's thinking, I want to get to that title match, and I want to win. You know, this is another opportunity. It doesn't matter that he shot 250 and 260. I mean, even though he needed the 260 to win the first game, it doesn't matter how much if he doesn't continue to win. One loss, and you're gone. Amleto thus far this year, but $58,540 in his pocket. Like to add 17,000 more, which is on top this week. Boy, did he give that one room. And it came oh, back. Oh, oh my. <laughs> Racing back for a dandy of a 258 game. And Leto Monticelli red hot here in Riverside, California. At Active West Town Square Lane says uh, he continues to blister the pocket. 258 to 193. And that was the old uh, steamroller shot there in game number two. Coming up next, powerful Mark Baker will try and stand in Emletto's way and looking for title number one. Back at the Town Square Lanes, and to give an illustration of that heel-toe movement, watch Emletto on this particular shot. Five-step player, holds the ball low as he starts out, and you see the heel go first, and then the toe. Heel-toe all the way through. It's that next to last step. Now watch the long slide and the snap through with his follow-through. Unusual delivery, but he's averaging over 260 with it. And don't forget, coming up next, oh my goodness, what an outstanding semifinal match. Amleto Monticelli and the tall one from Garden Grove, California, who won just two weeks ago, Mark Baker. 25-year-old Amleto Monticelli is averaging a blistering 263 for the opening two games. He'll bowl in the semifinal match against Mark Baker in just a couple of moments. But standing by now with our tournament leader is Mike Durbin. He along with Brian Voss. Thank you, Danny. And here we have Brian Voss, who is our tournament leader tonight. And Brian, just a few weeks ago, we saw you bowling in Las Vegas. You needed a double in the 10th frame there to get your first, or not your first title, but to get your first doubles title with Les Zykes. You got the first one and left a solid 10. Have you recovered from that, or are you still having bad dreams? Uh, pretty much. You know, uh, I'm disappointed at the result, but uh, pretty pleased with my performance. Uh, it's tough enough to make a good shot, but when you need it to win a tournament, uh, I feel like I did my job, um, but just a little disappointed in the result. I felt like you did your job, too. I thought it was going to strike. I've got to ask you about this. You're 0-6 you're from the number one position, and here you are right back again for the seventh time from that number one position. What's going to make number seven different for Brian Voss? Well, you know, the last few times I've been on television uh, leading a tournament, I, I feel like I've performed pretty well. I, in my opinion, things are going to even out. Uh, mm -hmm. Everything happens out here on tour. You get bad breaks, you get good breaks, but they even out. Uh, and eventually, that's my attitude. They're just going to even out, and I, I feel like it's going to happen today. So one for seven sounds like pretty good odds for you right now, huh? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> okay. You've got Mark Baker going over there. Throws the big hook ball, won two weeks ago. You've got Amleto Monticelli averaging 263. Would anyone you want to bowl? Well, you know, I'd prefer to bowl Amleto because he hasn't won. But on the other hand, he's, he's averaging 260 right now. Uh, both players are, are, are awful good. Uh, I really don't care who I bowl, but I think it's going to be a tough match, whoever I bowl. One last question, 45 and 6. Are you going to finish first or last? I'm going to watch this game and see uh, how the players are bowling on each lane. But, you know, I prefer to throw the last ball. But if it's an advantage to finish on the other lane, uh, that's what I'm going to do. Brian, good luck to you tonight. Maybe you can get what first win from the number one position. Thank Denny, you. back to you. Uh, thank you very much, Mike Durbin. And uh, don't forget, this summer, it's the LPBT Ladies Pro Bowling Tour. Six weeks of summer tour action. 
And of course, six weeks in the fall, it begins on January, or should make that July 27th. Jeez, it's not that cool outside. I'll be joining Leila Wagner for the commentary this summer in the first tournaments in Lake Charles, Louisiana. So stay tuned for LPBT action. But now let's return to Southern California. There you see the handshake between Amleto Monticelli and Mark Baker. Monticelli averaging 263 for the opening couple of games. is going to take a moment or so to uh, step back until a few of the technicians reset the lights. Uh, Amleto obviously doesn't want to be disturbed here in the opening shot. And Mike, uh, you're sprinting very nicely from the approach back up here to the booth. Well, we're going to find out which one of the big hookball bowlers is going <laughs> to be in that title match. Amleto Monticelli has struck 20 out of a possible 24 frames. Pretty good percentage, huh? Yeah, I like his What's chances. That about 80%? Over 80? Oh, excuse me, it's 21 out of 25 now. <laughs> well, do you think he might have a shot at Nelson Burton's four-game record? Wait, he's not thinking about four-game record right now. He's yeah, thinking about. I am. He's thinking about, how do I beat Mark Bay? <laughs> Why is it that we always project and get these people into trouble like that? We should never do that. And all the fans at home are saying, you're jinxing him, you're jinxing him. That's right. Okay, that's it. I won't say anymore. There it goes. And leaves the tip. And as big and powerful as Mark Baker is and how he can overpower a lane, he doesn't hook it quite as much as M. Little. Smiling Mark Baker, 26 years of age. Thus far in 87, averaging just a little better than 214 from nearby Garden Grove. Just a couple of weeks ago, he won the Kessler Open in Dublin. Beat David Ozio in that title. Picks up the 10 pin. That was title number three for Mark, but uh, a couple of years since he had won, he's been rejuvenated. He finished eighth last week in Seattle. He's right back on the show this week. So the big fellow from Garden Grove is starting to get things uh, on the ball. And we watched him this week. He had plenty of opportunity to blow his cool, lose his temper, but he didn't do that. He kept himself under control and made his comeback. He struggled in the first few games last night, but pulled well at the end. Loves to bowl in Southern California. Make no mistake about that. Uh, he's had an outstanding record in this neck of the woods. And uh, imagine he's going to have to pull out all the stops to beat uh, Amleto Monticelli here this evening. And there you see the determination on Mark Baker's face. He realizes he's in for a dogfight tonight. Well, Mark's goal is to be the best bowler in Southern California history. And there have been an awful lot of good bowlers come out of Southern California. Something bothered Amleto. I don't know exactly what it was. extra time. Oh, he knocks that 10 pin out of there. And Leto with six career 300 games, you know, another interesting note, and boy, you hate to bring this up, and Leto's won $259,234 in his career, ranks second behind Pete McCordick in career earnings without a PBA title. Well, he says he's out to correct that tonight. You have no more asterisks next to his name. Six second place finishes in his career thus far. Four three. And the 10 pin. Six pin went whistling around the 10 that time. Well, just didn't have the power to knock it out of there that time. The ball came in very late behind the head pin. And when you're coming in from that steep of, angle, of an angle, a lot of times you will leave the 10. Thus far for Amleto, stats for 87, three TV finals, seven finishes in the top 24, and 13 caches and 17 events. At the temp in. No problem. Well, he's got a wealth of experience. He's had 16 appearances on national television, so it certainly couldn't be the fact that he's nervous. Obviously, I mean, 260, 250, he's not too nervous right now. Mark Baker has really bounced back. Had some back problems over the last year or so, some spasms and problems with ligaments, but uh, they appear to be out of the way, and uh, this time Baker pulls up a little shy and pulls up the reins, and I don't know if the grip wasn't good in the bowling ball or if he started too quick. I think that the, he felt it slipping off his thumb as he went into his downswing and dried his hand. Oh. 
Lost that ball again. Looks at his hand and um, Greek Church four six seven nine ten. Well, obviously he was uncomfortable from the very beginning with he, his grip. He, right. He never got comfortable on that shot at all. And here he goes. Over about the second arrow. But you see that follow through? So how short it was? Looked like he lost it on the way down. Mike, is, might that be a good tip for uh, the league bowlers? If, if you feel uncomfortable with your ball on the way to the line to stop, it's awful hard to stop. These pros have such great concentration. But uh, should you or should you just continue to throw the shot? Well, I think he did the right thing. He stopped and reset himself. <laughs> it didn't do any good. He's mm -hmm. still got an open wind up with 44 and a third. Um, it is awful hard to stop. Uh, I know many, many times that I'd, I'd make my own delivery and I'd be thinking that something was amiss on the way to the line and I'd go ahead and throw the shot when I knew I should have stopped. So hard to do that, though, ooh, once you get the ooh. momentum going. Wow. Well, he's just fighting his release right now. He's not getting out of that ball clean. Almost got none on that one. Mm -hmm. That was very, almost a long straight shot there. Yeah, he's very forcing to get eight. You know, it's amazing. Mark told me during practice, he said, Denny, the lanes are a little tighter than they were throughout the week. He said, you know, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if I threw a gutter ball tonight. And he almost did there. Converts the spare, but obviously he is struggling while Amleto Monticelli is bowling very well. Amleto leads by 25, pondering his future here in the Southern California Open. This is unfortunately what Mark Baker left, and it's the 476910, better known as the Greek Church. It's almost an inside straight. <laughs> you wonder where the ball went. There's not a big hole there, right? But uh, bad news to any bowler as he leaves it. Ah, here are the past winners. Matt Carlson, the first foreign champion ever in PBA history, finished 28th this week. He almost made the finals. Well, we may have the second one. You know, Ben Leto may be the second one here. Uh, Dennis Jakes won in 85. Gary Skidmore with a brilliant performance in 84. And then, of course, Jimmy Pritz in 1983. So they've had some outstanding players win here. And the one that Pritz won in 1983 was when Don Janello didn't add right. He got the first strike in the 10th frame, thought he needed another one, left that same Greek church, and threw it in the channel, and Pritz won up by winning by two pins. Yep, Christmas came early that year. Monticelli, 49 in the second, a spare up in the third, and guess what? All right, back in the pocket for a strike on the right-hand lane. Boy, he has just been superb here this evening. I better watch out. If he continues to bowl like this, I need to congratulate him in Spanish, right? Can you do that? Well, I'm going to give it a try. <laughs> no, he is a very likable guy. Boy, really works hard at this game. As Mike and I mentioned, coming in, averaging 251 throughout the week on this pair and averaging 263 tonight. He'll want to take this pair home with him. One more increases it to 35 pin lead. Really gave it a lot of room. Here it comes. Oh, oh, oh boy. It's like a magnet just drawing into that one three pocket. Well, Amleto comes from a bowling family. His dad owns a bowling center in Venezuela. And uh, he's been bowling probably since he was... Uh, Knee high to a ball return. Well, it shows. Baker in a bad position. He just needs to get striking right away. A lot of room. And it came back and made it. Well, Baker tries to uh, avert disaster right now and right himself and get back into the match. There's still plenty of room, Mike Durbin. But it's always tough when you're halfway through the game, you haven't had a double yet, and you're down by 35 pins, and you expect your opponent to get more strikes. And there's Mark Baker's family, his dad to the right. Don't look and too happy right now. No, <laughs> I don't blame him. Stepmother in the middle, and of course, his sister. Or the double. Perfect. Yeah, that'll cheer up the hometown fans and family as well. Keeps him alive, gets a little momentum building. Now he has to hope that Amleto just slows down, that he just stops for a frame, you know. Not necessarily root against him to get an open or anything, but just stop striking is all Mark is thinking. You can see the pressure written all over his face. Just give me any kind of an opening, Amleto. A lot of room. <laughs> you sound like a broken record. <laughs> a lot of room. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, he's playing a game that most of us in the bowling industry are completely unfamiliar with, Mike. When you're hooking 25 boards, I mean, uh, that's out of reach. 
<laughs> it's just normal for him. I'll tell you, it's just a natural shot for him. Yeah, he's just smoothing it right now. I don't think he's really hitting it that hard. It's amazing, too, to me. His span is very wide uh, as well. You would think uh, with as much pressure as he's got on his shoulder and his wrist that he might cut down on the span a little bit, but he really stretches out. Well, let's get all the lift that he can, and he does. Looks like a choir boy, doesn't he? One more. Hi. Uh-oh. Broke up the split. Big break there because that ball just hooked about two feet too soon on the lane. A little bit soft with the speed, or it could be that we're getting a little overreaction now. But the ball just hooked just a little bit too soon. He get it, gets it in the same area as we can see here. But watch it as it goes down the lane. Starts biting too quick now, and right there you know it's going high. Look at that label turnover. Look at that break. He gets knocking that six pin out of there. I was going to say, it takes a couple of breaks to win. On the two occasions he's thrown the ball through the nose tonight, he's broken up those splits. That's what you need. And Ambleto settles in, gets comfortable with the fact that he leads by 33. Stay tuned, Ambleto will. Talented Mark Baker finds himself trailing by 33, but he's working on a double if he strikes twice, Mike, and we're right back in the match. Well, he's got to take him one at a time. Kind of a cliche, but still has to do it that way. Here it comes. Baker can strike. When he gets himself together emotionally and gets his, his emotional stability right there, he can throw a lot of strikes. You just can't throw a bowling ball any more powerfully or better than this. It's a very muscled swing, but he gets it right in time with heavy fingers. The ball finishes hard right over that 17th board at the pocket. All 10 pins in the pit. Mike, would you compare Mark Baker to perhaps a player like Jim Godman? Similar. Oh, is it going to fall? Yes. Woo! A little delayed reaction on that seven pin. Yeah, a little hand slapping there, high fiving himself almost that time. And the it's vibration from the slap knocked it over <laughs> there at the end. As he comes in very thin, gives it a lot of room. He says, hurry, ball. And the head pin hits. I don't know what pin that was, whether it was the eight or the four that knocked that seven over. Mm hmm. He means business. So a four bagger. Now it's a 13 pin game as Amleto steps up in the eighth. And as Amleto strikes, if we look back to the third frame, when he left that Greek church, he got seven out on a strike, which cost him two pins in count, which means it would be a, a 11 pin ball game at this point instead of 13. We'll see if that comes back to haunt him as we enter the ninth frame. And in these semifinal games, every stick always counts. And ironically enough, right now, as Monticelli has been ahead in this match all the way, if Amleto does not strike on this ball, Mark Baker can strike out and lock him out. Don't think that uh, Mark Baker isn't aware of that. Well, look at those eyes. Wow. <laughs> See the extra loft on that particular shot, and then he's kind of the icy stare. You're going to go down. Boy, you know those South Americans, they got that hot blood, and boy. Amleto is really keying it up now. Watch how far he gets it over the foul line here. What, look at the dots. Out to the dots, which are five to six feet out on the lane. And then the seven pin almost stands here. Just kind of slides off. Wow. Baker. It's like a one hopper to the shortstop. Boy, Amleto. Baker has to strike. And five, three, six. Cut it short, no follow through. Looks like he stood up a little bit on the shot, too. That's what pressure will do to you a lot of times. And there you can see Mark obviously realizing he made a mistake, and uh, now the burning question is can he still bail it out? The way Amleto has been striking could be difficult. Has to make this first. He's, he's got a breath of life. 222 is his potential if he goes all the way. Amleto is going at a 237 pace. If he strikes out, Amleto would leave some kind of seven pin split or something of that nature, like the 6, 7, 10 or something. We could have even a tie match. Well, anything can happen and usually will during the PBA televised finals. That's what makes it so exciting. Has to have this one. A lot of room, too much room. Oh. Mm -hmm. so one, two, four, six, ten, and Amleto is going to be bowling Brian Voss for the title. For the title. Absolutely amazing. Last night, Mark Baker threw eight strikes in one game and had three five counts as well. He watches it. 
and he knew immediately. Mm -hmm. That was out to lunch from the get-go. How about the conversion? Not quite. Well, well Mark Baker obviously disappointed. And uh, Amleto Monticelli continues the march to the top. And uh, we might as well mention it right now, if he were to strike out in this game and shoot 257, he is on track to be uh, a give Nelson Burton Jr.'s record a, a challenge. Yeah, but you told me not to mention that. Oh, he really threw that one out there. And it didn't make it this time, the 2-8. I think he might have been testing the waters that time, Mike, to see how far he could throw it right or no? No, I think uh, it was our fault. <laughs> okay. yeah. Speak for yourself now, come on. Nevertheless, uh, with a spare and a strike, it's 235, so the scores are coming down a little bit, but still he's bowling at an excellent pace. By the way, Nelson Burton Jr.'s record is 1,050 for four games. Well, he's a Hall of Famer. You can understand how he could shoot 1050. Wasn't that in St. Louis? That was in front of the hometown fans, too. Correct. Oh, Correct. So I'm Leto Monticelli from Venezuela, breathing a little easier, realizing that uh, at this point, after six years on the PBA Tour, that uh, he's within grasp of his first PBA title. Well, this is where Mats Carlson did it here last year. Maybe Amleto can do it in the same bowling center one year, to, almost to the day later. That's right, it was July 2nd last year. <laughs> well, that was Rip City on the right-hand lane, so a 40-pin victory, 235 to 195, and that's the third straight player that Amleto Monticelli has disposed of here at Active West. Town Square Lanes in Riverside, California, as he uh, is in the hunt in search of PBA title number one here in Southern California. And coming up next, he'll be matched up with the tournament's top seed. There you see 235 to 195. And Leto Monticelli is about as hot as you can get. And the title match coming up next. There you see him. Brian Voss, the top seed. He's 0 for 6. Will tonight be his lucky night? Stay tuned. Boy, Mike, some great bowling throughout the week. These are the guys who didn't quite make it to the show, but, boy, they had big weeks. And Dave Ferraro, who's been bowling super all year. John Gant, as we mentioned, bowled 249 the last game and still failed to make it. Randy Lightfoot had a whopping 290 his last game. And he of the big hook, Jimmy Keith. Matt Serena had a good tournament, a name from the past. And as you look on down the list, oh, my goodness, Mark Roth, who made the show last week, finishing up 12th, and John Odrabinak at 15th. 16th, uh, Wayne Webb, Bill Straub in 17th, Mike Edwards in his seventh consecutive finals, and there's a name that we've seen before, Marshall Holman, 19th, with Ron Palumbi Jr. in 20th. And rounding out the top 24, Art Trask and Frank Ellenberg battled it out for that uh, 24th spot, and Frank just edged him in the clutch. And coming up next week, down in Tucson, Arizona, it's the Miller Lite Challenge, $140,000 worth July 8th. And, of course, the following week will be in Austin, Texas, for the Austin Open, July 15th. Of course, live on ESPN. Looking on down the line, the Hammer Open in Edmond, Oklahoma, on July 22nd, July 29th, the Kessler Senior Touring Pro Doubles Classic for the first time from Green Bay, Wisconsin. So we'll head to Packerland, Mike Durbin. Last time I was in Green Bay, I think it was either 67 or 68. That was, almost, that was almost before <laughs> Marshall Holman was born. And speaking of the inimitable, Marshall Holman, you're looking at uh, Brian Voss pacing, getting ready for the title match, but Marshall Holman, who finished 19th here this week in the Southern California Open, will join us in the broadcast booth. Marshall, welcome. Thank you, Danny. Pleasure to be here. And we'll get your uh, feelings about uh, the title match. Uh, I know that uh, you've had some success in Southern California. What about this tournament individually, Marshall? Well, I've made the top five, I think, twice here, Denny, uh, but uh, nothing really big. Uh, this is going to be a fun match. You know, we've got... We've got uh, Amleto, who's had a problem winning. We've got Brian Voss, who hasn't won from the lead position. I know how both of those people feel. Uh, it's going to be a good match. Okay, let me put you on the spot real quick. If you were bowling and you were the top seed, which one of these two guys would you want to face for the title? Which one do you think you might have a better chance with? Well, I'll tell you, I have I have faced uh, Amleto and beat him from the top seeded position, and I've lost to Brian Voss from the top seeded position. So uh, I guess maybe Amleto. All right, here we go. Brian Voss on the left-hand lane. 28 years of age. And it's interesting, Brian said that he liked to have to throw the strike, so he's picked to finish on lane 46, figuring that if he has to throw that clutch double, he can do it. Well, 
that's the way to start. Well, he's got him dancing on the deck on the left-hand lane, and boy, that's got to relax you a little bit, Marshall, to start off with a strike. Absolutely. I, I like to get off to a good start. I, I don't like to have to throw the strike uh, late in the game. I like to get it over, out of the way very, very quickly. And Leto Monticelli shooting 761 for the opening three games. Needs 289 to tie Nelson Burton Jr., so he better not miss too often. Don't count him out. Well, he can't miss from here on out if he's going to do anything with the record. You know, when Brian starts the match like that, there's a calculated risk when you choose that way to start first that your opponent opens up with a double and suddenly before you even can wipe your glasses, you're 10 pins behind. Marshall, what's your normal philosophy there? Do you like to start or finish? I like to... Uh, to finish first and let the opposition have to make the shots. See, all the great ones did that. Weber, that was his philosophy. <laughs> sure, Marshall's won 20 times, including two Firestones, so he knows how to win. And Leto Monticelli trying to learn how to win on the PBA Tour, though, 0 for 6, second place finishes. And well, he says, I can't start any better than that. Well, characteristically, Marshall, this has been a high-scoring house. Why? I think uh, you know it's a combination of the uh, of the good lane service and the uh, the PBA lane maintenance people put out a kind of shot that both right-handers and left-handers can score pretty big on. Uh, it's a it's a very very accommodating surface. Most of the players played out this week as well, right, Marshall? Yeah, absolutely. And when you play the outside trajectory, you get the big carry. Voss needs the strike to stay with him. And does. Uh, oh, we're in for a dogfight here, Mike. Boss, really, the last couple of trips from the top-seeded spot has bowled pretty doggone well and just come up empty-handed. As there you see Brian Boss. Uh, yep, they like to call him Cupcake out here on the national tour. We're speaking of the ladies, of course. A very popular figure. The unfortunate times that you're speaking of is in Cleveland this year. Brian was the top seed, and he struck out in the 10th frame to force Ferraro to do the same, and Dave Ferraro did it, and then he needed a double in the 10th frame to win in Las Vegas, got the first one, and left that awful 10th bit. Awful from his standpoint. Uh -oh. Light breaks down the 2-4-5 for only the 2-4. A little more speed and loft and not quite as clean a release that time. Do you think perhaps maybe he got a little bit uh, keyed up after the first two shots? Absolutely. Now watch it here. The thumb just doesn't get out real clean. He gets it way out on the lane, almost to the dots, and it breaks late. No or very little turn. Easy spare. Brian told me uh, in the practice session before the telecast that he was going to have to stay nice and slow. If he got a little quick with his feet or quick with the ball, uh, it was going to sail on him, and I think that's what happened there. Well, the lanes are a little bit tighter today, and that's exactly what he's trying to do, but sometimes it's hard to do under that kind of pressure. Oh, absolutely. I think I think Amleto is really, really needs to get these next couple of strikes and put the heat on Brian early. Well, there you see the graphics. Three straight victories for Amleto Monticelli, and all in convincing fashion. Light. Ooh, a little chink in the armor there. Leaves only the 2-8. There have been a lot of 2 8 tens on almost that same hit. Marshall, you didn't leave any of those this week, did you? <laughs> I left a lot of 2 a lot of 2 8 tens. And Leto trying to root it on up there. Now he's just hoping to avoid a split. <laughs> oh, mm. A little concern there on that face, isn't there? Yeah, a little disgruntled, but I tell you what, he's plenty happy that the 10-pin didn't stand. Tough spare. Not easy spare. Makes it look easy. Well, no shot at Nelson Burton Jr.'s record, but who cares at this point? Monticelli just wants the victory. Absolutely. And Leto just uh, could care less about the record. And Leto finishing second at the showboat in Atlantic City and also in the PBA National. So he got up and bowled well in some very big tournaments this year. Yeah, and it's, it seems like he's either had the, the bad break late in the game or, uh, you know, lost some concentration late in the game. If he has a shot going toward the end of this game, I think this time he'll make the big shot and win the tournament. He needs to stay close. A lot of room. Huh? Oh, that ball was in the gutter at 50 feet, guys, and he almost struck. <laughs> huh? All of 10. Now, let me ask you this, Marshall. When you get into that situation, you know you got a little room, and you get keyed up. Uh, do you keep throwing it further to the right? Well, you know, I think when you're when you're Amleto's age, maybe you do throw it even further to the right. Uh, when you get a little older, you have a tendency to, to go a little more direct with the ball. As, uh, most players out here find out. 
Well, both players are on their games here early on in the title match of the Southern California Open. Very close indeed. Brian Voss leads by one, but uh, still a lot of bowling left. Back to live action. Brian Voss ahead by a pin, bowling in the fourth. And uh, it's nail-biting time here in Southern California. And we should mention that uh, somebody's bad luck or whatever you want to call it, jinx, or whatever, is going to end here. Brian is 0 for 6 from the top spot, and Amleto has 6 seconds, so somebody's going to end that 6. And had the 2-8 and leaves only the 2-pin. Our guest here tonight knows something about that awful word, jinx, don't you, Marshall? Well, absolutely. Uh, I went a couple of years, uh, 20, 21, 22 shows in a row where I never won, and, and it does it does start to wear on you for a while. Now, I don't know if, if uh, Brian got a little nervous, or if the oil is carrying down, but that's a, a couple of light hits on this right-hand lane. And I've always said the toughest shot to throw is right out of commercial. And he came in a little light. Oh. The interesting thing, Mike, about Brian Voss, rather than adjust with equipment, isn't he the kind of player that normally will do so with hand release or perhaps speed? Isn't he more apt to make that kind of an adjustment? Definitely, Dan. He He's learned to do that in his game since he came out here. He used to to uh, miss a lot of spares when he first came out. Then he started learning how to make spares by throwing harder and straighter at him on the PBA Tour. He's really refined his game. Then he hooked the ball quite a bit for a while. Now he's more like a, a straight shooter nowadays. He's not getting that great big hook. But he's sure getting the results. And we're even Steven now through four frames. Remember, he wants to stay slow. And that's the result when he does. Now a little hop, skip, and a jump from Brian Voss, who is currently ranked ninth in money earnings this year with better than 61,000. Nice free swing. A little bit of a swing out there. Clean release that time. No turn at all. But the ball finishes half pocket, knocks that 10 right out with a good finger lift. And Leto needing a strike to stay even. Came up light the last time on this lane. He'll probably just throw a little wider. Just like that. What a beautiful shot. I'll tell you, he's got such a dynamic release. And, uh, you know, he's never won, but it just he doesn't seem like he's scared. Marshall, back in the old days, you and Mark Roth were obviously the biggest hook players on the tour. Now you got players like Baker and Amleto. I mean, Marshall, you're, you're turning into a straight player well, out there. I've definitely become more of a middle-of-the-road player. And, uh, you know, fortunately, things are still going well with my game. But... Uh, Boy, I don't hit it like these young guys do. Is it intimidating to bowl against a guy like Jimmy Keith? It's fun to bowl against a guy like Jimmy Keith, especially when he shoots spares. <laughs> Boy, it's tense here. For the lead. Oh, out to the one board almost, oh. and it came back. That was flush city, too. What a great shot. See, and he gets a question about that. And he, he gets the finish on that lane. Now watch this. That ball is going to start right around the ninth or 10th board as he drifts left, the open shoulder, snaps it out there, goes about the 8th board, and watch it get out just almost a 1 there, about 2. And now watch it go over 15 boards in the last 10 feet. Oh, he's really got some juice on that shot. It's kind of interesting. You have one player going fairly straight, the other using every board on the lane. And they're both striking. Boss for a double in the 6th. And boy, does he need it now. <laughs> A little slower that time, a little slower ball speed. Both times. And you see, even with the slower ball speed, the ball is just barely making it up to the pocket. Is he excited about this shot? Oh, look at that head. Yes, sirree. You can see the determination on his face. I mean, both players are working so hard to get this monkey off their back, and they're both carrying it. Re-rack on 45. I was say first one for Brian Voss. We should tell our viewers that each player is allowed three, and only three. If they use up the three and then want another one, as long as there's 10 pins standing at the other end of the lane, they got to shoot it. Is this a double re-rack? A double re-rack. And Brian Voss has used up his three. That's how, that's how important he feels this shot is. He wants to take the lead right now on this left lane, and he's used them all up. Okay, he re-racked in the very first frame that we weren't aware of. So he's uh, fresh out. We'll have to make do with what stands up the rest of the way. Oh, he picked the right rack. Oh, and he pounded the fist that time, too. He realized that could have been the pivotal shot in the match because, once again, now the pressure is thrust upon him, little Monticelli's shoulders. I don't think the rack made any difference with that shot. He just threw it so high flush that uh, he was going to carry 10 anyway. Yeah, and Leto, is, but you need the confidence. Out of now, and Leto's taken one re-rack. 
down 10, 7th frame. the nose of 36910 the ball hooked two or three feet too quickly on the lane boy tough spare spare is tougher than the strike right now and there you see Amleto shaking his head he knew instantly that uh, he did not get the projection on the shot let's see it falls off balance to the right and the ball goes left and he's got to make this spare to stay in the match he's going to be down 14 if he makes it doesn't make it, boy. And well, Leto has done that. That's his first open frame in four games, almost four games now, but it couldn't have come at a worse time. It was a key, it was a key shot. He needed that shot to, to stay even with Brian, and, uh, you know, now he's really dug himself a big hole, but Marshall, it's not over. Marshall, how does your mental game change between a semifinal game and a title game for your first match? Well, if you, you know, if you've never won before, it's a, it's a very, very big difference. Uh, you know, not just winning the difference between the first and second place prize money, but, you know, Firestone and all that goes with it. So it's it's a big, big mental load. Well, Monticelli will try and scratch his way back into the match, gives it plenty of room and strikes on lane 45. So never say die to the youngster from Venezuela. Well, the way he's hitting lane 45, if he can get a strike on 46, he's still potential 231. Right now, Voss is going in a 227 clip. So... The old adage, it's not over until the fat lady swings, is still going here. But Ryan is up 26 pins, and he wants to really slam the door on him right now. And he loves this bowling center. He finished third here last year. He lost to Dave Houston in the semifinal game. Oh, whoop, there's the break. That's unbelievable. I mean, uh, right now, if I'm Brian Voss, I'm saying there's no way I can lose. Comes in light. Looked like a good shot, but the ball doesn't make it. The one pin does not hit the two, but comes back off the wall. And I think that was the four pin that fell into the two, between the two and eight. And Brian says, all right. And he's saying that. You can see that look on his face. Right. He's saying there's no way I can lose. He's mm -hmm. probably going to stuff this one to the gills. Plus, right he's here. probably thinking, hey, you owe me a couple, too. Absolutely. There it is. Ah, and off to the races goes Brian Voss, who is really trying to end uh, a very unhappy era in his book. An 0 for 6 start uh, from the top spot, and uh, there's nothing worse probably mentally out here on the tour than to lead an event and get beat on the show. Oh, absolutely. I've, well, I've, I've, speak, two I've guys experienced. Two guys from experience there, right? <laughs> yeah, we've experienced both of those, and, uh, you know, Amleto... Now, now he's got it. It was just that one shot, and it's just kind of a shame, but he'll be back. Still potential 231. He can make Voss show up for that 10th frame. It's uh, highly unlikely, but you, stranger things have happened. you got to remember how uh, Jimmy Pretz won his first title with uh, Don Janello. We talked about that earlier, so you just never know in this game. Brian Voss currently shooting at a 267 pace. Got to have this one to have any prayer. And he does. Boy, it's amazing. Just one errant shot. He can wind up with nine strikes in this game and almost be shut out in the 10th frame. One more, though, puts him in the 230 bracket. It would force Brian to at least mark with a decent count in the 10th frame. I mean, he could open in the 10th frame and win with, with a, uh, a high count, but if he got a big split... Nope. Well, that ends it all together. Brian Voss is going to be our Southern California Open champion, and Amleto has got seven seconds now. Boy, it's so tough. You know, you climb, you scale that mountain, you get just to the top where you want to get to the peak and look over the other edge and take a, take a nice full view, and uh, the footing slips a little bit, and you end up somewhere down about halfway down the mountain. I uh, know, poor Amleto, you know, he's, he's bowled so good so many times, but, uh, you know, he needed to make a good shot in the seventh. He came up short. Uh, Brian got the break that, that maybe he's deserving of because he has had a lot of tough breaks. And now it doesn't make any difference. He's happy. He's won from the top seed, and, and I'm sure he'll probably do it again. Boy, what about uh, Brian Voss now with two victories here in 1987? Joins Randy Peterson as the only multiple champion, so Bowler of the Year honor certainly uh, would start to maybe move in his direction if he continues to bowl well this summer. 
That's a possibility. I, I don't think he's thinking about that right now. I think he's just, he's just really, really happy to be a winner. Let me ask you this, uh, Marshall, on, on M. Leto's part. When you have to win three grueling games just to get to the title match, does it take something out of you, or, or are you relaxed and confident when you get there? Well, I can't remember what year it was, but I bowled uh, in Milwaukee in the Millers, and I shot 750 for three games, and then shot 150 against Fred Jasky, so it took something out of me there. <laughs> Well, there you see Brian Voss gets the handshake, the fists are clenched, 245 to 219, and you can see the relief on his face. He has accomplished the goal that he was after, Mike Durbin. Well, he got that big break in the eighth frame, and that's what he needed. Without that, it has still been a real tight match, but he's had so many bad breaks in that type of situation before that he, he was right when at the interview he said that they were going to even out, and they did. So in your mind... That open in the seventh was the key to Brian Voss's victory. We'll be back to chat with Mr. Voss and talk about the Southern California Open victory right after these messages. Mike Durbin back at the Town Square Lanes in Southern California in Riverside, California. And in the seventh frame, Amleto Monticelli needed a strike to stay even with Brian Voss, and he'd been murdering both lanes up to this point. Little left of target, the ball hooks too soon, right through the heart of the pins. He leaves, not a split, but the 3, 6, 9, 10. He failed to convert that split. Later on, Brian Voss on the same lane in the eighth frame gets the good break he's been searching for from the top seated position so often. As he comes in light and doesn't really hit the pocket, but the four pin falls forward, something hits the eight, and he carries the two pin forward for a strike. Went on to capitalize on that strike and take him on to his first victory from the top seat of position. He's going to go home with $17,000 this week. Amleto takes home $9,000 in his seventh second place finish. Mark Baker, $6,000 for third. He'll take that. Rowdy Morrow, five for fourth. And Dave Arnold in his first appearance, $4,000 for fifth place. And right now, Denny is with our winner, Brian Voss. We had a couple of technical difficulties, but what the heck, Brian Voss is all smiles. He had no problems whatsoever in winning the Southern California Open. You were 0 for 6 from the top spot. Certainly that had to be in the back of your mind, but you came up victorious this evening. Well, I always feel like out on tour, uh, everything's going to even out. You have some bad luck and some good luck, and, uh, you know, it's just going to even out. And it, I'm fortunate that it turned out that way today. My congrats to Amaletto. He's a great player. He'll win. He really is, and uh, one of our streaks was going to be broken today, and uh, I'm glad it was mine. So you, you say that things even out, so in other words, you'll win your next six titles from the top spot in succession. Is that correct? I don't think so, but I, I'd sure like to think like that. <laughs> well, let's introduce Mr. Paul Spiegel now of Active West, and he has a very nice check for you, Brian Boss. Brian, I guess the seventh time is a charm. It's a great icebreaker, and from all of us at Active West, congratulations on a great match. Thank you very much. Thank you, Active West. Boy, 17,000, huh? So yeah, nice check. I, I know your mother was watching in Colorado this evening. She couldn't be here, but Mr. Bill Martin, the general manager here, will step in and present you with a gorgeous trophy. And I know Mom will probably be able to polish that up a little bit. Bill? Oh, yeah. Congratulations, Brian. Last year you were on our show in Active West, and this year you made it all the way to the top, and we're proud to have you as our champion. Thank you very much. Uh, do I have to carry this on the airplane? <laughs> and stepping in now, Mike Durbin. And uh, Mike, I know we both had our doubts from time to time as to whether or not this youngster was going to win from the top spot. But boy, he bowled brilliantly here this evening. Well, I'd just like to congratulate Brian. One quick question. Uh, Amleto was just whipping along and there are those three, first three games. Were you a little bit afraid going into that match? Not really. You know, you, you got to go out there believing that you can win. No, it, it's like that. You, you got to think you can win out here. 
or, or you never will. And, and you entered the match uh, with a lot of confidence in yourself, and, and that's the way you got to look at it. And I'd like to comment on that also. You could tell from the look on his face as we were watching that he had the determination this time that that 0 for 6 streak was going to go by the boards. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. You've, won, you've won twice now already. Maybe a third time in 87? Well, certainly that's in the back of my mind. Um, I feel like I'm in contention for Bowler of the Year, and uh, I hope that today will have kind of a snowball effect and I'll win a few more. And, of course, you'll be bowling next week in Tucson? Next week is a, a good tournament for, uh, I think Miller's our sponsor once again, and uh, that's a big tournament. Yeah, looking forward to that. And they got plenty of money on top. It's $140,000 worth, but this is the Southern California Open winner for 1987. How about a final round of applause as we say goodbye from Riverside, California. week on ESPN. It's the $140,000 Miller Lite Challenge, live from Golden Pin Lanes in Tucson, Arizona, 9 p.m. Eastern Time on ESPN.